In 1945, after a four-year stint in the Navy, Hubbard became involved in ritual magic with a protege of British Satanist Alistair Crowley. They start performing ceremonies to find a woman who will be willing to be the mother of an incarnation of the Antichrist, Babylon. Sexual ceremonies were performed between Parsons and Cameron with Hubbard watching and telling them what to do and observing things on the astral plane. And this was meant to, you know, she would become pregnant and they would control this elemental destructive force. I can't emphasize this too much. Hubbard was trying to incarnate pure evil so that he could control it to his own ends. But the church insists that Hubbard's participation in the alleged rituals was part of a government mission. We know about L. Ron Hubbard. He was sent in by one of the American security forces uh, with a brief to shut the thing down, which effectively he did. Government agent or not, Hubbard was destined to become the pop therapist of his era. In 1950, at the age of 39, he wrote an essay in astounding science fiction, detailing discoveries he made about the human mind in a science he called Dianetics. The essay became the foundation for Dianetics, the modern science of mental health. Dianetics through mind. And this book, that, that, that's the background of all of this. That's what started all the trouble. Little boxes on the hillside, little boxes. The world into which Dianetics was released in May of 1950 was overall a world of conformity. You had soldiers returning to the United States and they were effectively told this. You get yourself a good job, you get yourself a tract home, and you live a conformed life. And if you're lucky, you will get yourself a swimming pool after, of course, you've dug your bomb shelter. You will have children, and they will in turn will have grandchildren, and then you will die and you will become nothing. All of a sudden, here comes Dianetics. And Dianetics is saying, wait a minute, what if you can really rise above the state of a human being into something more special, into what ultimately became a clear? Hubbard claimed to have uncovered the cure of virtually every ailment known to man, and professed to have healed himself from partial blindness caused by an alleged war injury. Hubbard promised his book could work wonders on anyone who tried it. He said that, that he could take anybody who was not brain damaged and in less than a thousand hours of therapy, which could be done by somebody completely untrained other than having read the book, you could take this person to a state called clear. Hubbard claimed that all illnesses were psychosomatic and could be cured by eliminating painful past experiences from the brain. The brain is a sort of switchboard. And in grams is mental image pictures that consist of pain. Whether well, it's mental or physical pain, it's there. We have two minds. We have the uh, analytical mind that doesn't make mistakes at all. We have the reactive mind. That's the culprit. Hubbard said the troubling reactive mind could be forever discarded through auditing. During an auditing session, one confesses his innermost thoughts to another, all the while monitored by an electrometer, a tool similar to a lie detector. Auditing, said Hubbard, allowed one to relieve his mind from troubling past life traumas. Hubbard was eager to share Dianetics with prominent mental health experts. He said, here, you take it, use it, help people with it. They rejected it. They were afraid of it. But the book was an instant bestseller. And we expected this to sell about 6,000 copies, and, uh, and this textbook was published. And it hit the top of the bestseller list of the New York Times, and it just stayed there month in, month out. Hubbard's open contempt for the field of psychiatry and the popular theories of Sigmund Freud also caused a ripple. Is this a form of psychoanalysis? No, psychoanalysis, they lay back. Don't, don't associate Scientology with such people. That, that's terrible. That, that's bad manners, you know? I mean, that, that uh, business about sex and all that sort of thing. That's for the neurotic or the person who is insane or something like that. That has nothing to do with Scientology. The psychiatric institutions and, and prominent psychiatrists kept attacking Dianetics it became clear that what they were engaged in had nothing to do with helping anybody. It had nothing to do with making someone more capable of making someone happier. Electroshock therapy may be recommended for other disorders. It only had to do 
with keeping them quiet, giving them drugs, performing electric shock treatments on them. Hydrotherapy is useful in calming disturbed patients. Those sort of things are barbarities. And I think that Mr. Hubbard was one of the first people that stood up and said, wait a minute, this is wrong, something needs to be done about it. We're going to take responsibility for making sure that people are not being turned into vegetables at the hands of psychiatry. Glowing testimonies to Hubbard's technology led to the creation of the Hubbard Association of Scientologists. Based in Hollywood, the organization taught Hubbard's courses to those willing to pay the $25 an hour for the therapy. The Food and Drug Administration was suspicious. The FDA, which believed Hubbard was making medical claims for the E-meter, paid a visit to the D.C. organization in 1963. They hired a bunch of longshoremen, sent them into the church in Washington, and cleaned the place out. They took the books, they took the E-meters, they took the vitamins, they took everything out. Hubbard, furious was convinced that psychiatry professionals had tainted the U.S. government against him. When L. Ron Hubbard started Scientology and created Scientology in the 50s, he did it at the height of McCarthyism. And he came across with new ideas and a whole new way of looking at things and a new perspective. And J. Edgar Hoover at the time wasn't exactly fond of new ideas. And uh, the whole approach of the United States government was to be suspicious of, of new leaders were coming at the time. Martin Luther King was a, a great target of the FBI. L. Ron Hubbard was a target of the FBI. While Hubbard distrusted the government, he viewed psychiatry, a profession that also treated the human mind, as the number one enemy of Scientology. It was uh, part of the sort of lore that you learned when you went into the organization. Scientology has enemies. Some of them you will need to deal with very firmly. The enemy to Scientology is anybody that questions Scientology, anybody that opposes it, anybody that challenges it, anybody that in the Scientology language is counter-intentional. It was Hubbard's belief in the existence of a global conspiracy against Scientology that would define him and his church. The Aaron said that you have to fight back against your oppressor. If you don't, he will gain strength and more strength and more strength and wipe you out. When we return, L. Ron Hubbard feels the heat of the IRS and takes to the sea. The United States of the early 60s saw a new generation of Americans, suspicious of traditional authority. The atmosphere was ripe for L. Ron Hubbard, a sci-fi writer gone spiritual leader, to spread his promises of do-it-yourself healing to the people. We live in a world where, 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 uh, where we have governments and we have societies and so forth who are desperately trying to help man. They are trying, however, to solve his problems for him. By 1960, Hubbard had taken Dianetics one step further and founded the Church of Scientology. A cross appeared on Hubbard's buildings. His writings became scriptures and his students parishioners. It was an alternative therapy, an all, uh, a non-recognized alternative mental therapy. But Hubbard actually made us start wearing ministers uniforms and put up the trappings of religion around so that the IRS would get off his case. But Hubbard contended that since his work dealt with man as spirit separate from his body, he had entered the realm of religion. We have a 2,000 year history of man cons uh, as a spirit, whereas we only have less than a century of considering simply mud. And uh, therefore, uh, I my study is more traditional than uh, most philosophies. Hubbard and his upstart religion provoked contempt. Hubbard had been kicking over rocks and exposing things, and the government didn't like him, and the communists didn't like him, and, the, and Nixon didn't like him, and, and he had all these big enemies. The church outlined these enemies in its publication, Freedom Magazine. Freedom proudly published exposés on bizarre psychiatric practices, including what it called psychiatric work camps in South Africa and a strange deep sleep therapy in England. 
He talked about the secret program that was being conducted by the intelligence community using psychiatrists called MK Ultra that we finally found out about it, but it was using drugs and hypnosis in, tr in order to create, an, in essence, a Manchurian candidate. While Hubbard went after the government, the government went after him. In 1967, the IRS revoked the Church of Scientology's tax exemption, stating that Scientology was a commercial, not religious organization. Hubbard lived in luxury and was suspected of skimming huge sums of money from the church. He immediately became the subject of an IRS probe into his financial dealings. Outraged, Hubbard began penning a number of policy letters on how to deal with Scientology's enemies. The fair game policy refers to utterly destroying any critics. That a Scientologist can do whatever is required to destroy a critic. And the fair game policy is one of the policy letters in that series of documents that also include how to conduct a noisy investigation, black propaganda. In the Manual of Justice, he writes, uh, the purpose of the lawsuit is not to harass, but to destroy. Attorney Ford Green, a former follower of Sun Young Moon, says Scientology's policies did not come as a surprise. All cults draw a dichotomy between those on the inside and those on the outside, where those on the outside are lesser people and are treated by a whole different system of morality that can justify uh, misconduct from cheating, lying, to killing. Scientology calls it fair game. Uh, the Unification Church can call it heavenly deception. It became misinterpreted. And what it said was that if someone has left the Church of Scientology, or if someone is directly attacking the Church of Scientology, that person no longer has recourse to the internal ethics and justice procedures within the church. It was canceled, but for PR reasons, because it had been being misinterpreted. But ex-members claim that the militaristic policies remained. You have to understand that, that the mentality of the organization is that it's a, first of all, it's built on a military model. It's not a religious model. He's got policy letters that are called battle tactics, right? And there are battle plans. Hubbard's battle plan was executed by the Guardian's office, set up in 1966 to deal with Scientology foes. Hubbard, who had officially resigned as formal head of the church in 1966, put his wife, Mary Sue, in charge. But ex-members say Hubbard was still in charge. They were Aaron Hubbard's intelligence agency. That was their purpose, and indeed an intelligence specialist in the U.S. has said that they were as effective as the CIA. In 1973, the Guardian's office implemented a program known as Operation Snow White. The group began to use the Freedom of Information Act to access government files, and it proved federal agencies were circulating lies about the church. He dreamed up a conspiracy to explain all this problem, and he created a, a top-secret program called Snow White to uncover and find the source of this conspiracy. But Scientology did indeed uncover some bizarre documents in government files. At one point, there was a document that said, aha, we have discovered Timothy Leary has, knows a man called Alfred Hubbard. Alfred Hubbard obviously is L. Ron Hubbard. Therefore, perhaps L. Ron Hubbard is really Timothy Leary and that there is money from LSD being channeled into the Church of Scientology. I mean, this is how absurd these reports were. There was this constant barrage of assaults coming from these government agencies. So the Guardian's office was set up in order to deal with those external facing matters of the Church. The target of media scrutiny and under investigation by tax authorities, Scientology's founder evaded growing hostility against him by purchasing a yacht and taking to sea. He went off to begin a project of further research. He took with him a few very dedicated members of the religion, which became the nucleus of what we now know today as the Sea Organization. The most dedicated members of the religion are members of the Sea Organization. They dedicate their entire lives to accomplishing the goals and objectives of Scientology. It's the people who sign a billion-year contract come back lifetime after lifetime serving Hubbard. On the ship, 
Hubbard enhanced his bridge to total freedom, creating new levels above that of clear. Hubbard acquired more ships to accommodate the sea organization. The secrecy surrounding Hubbard's mini flotilla did not help Scientology's reputation abroad. Not only had to leave the United States, he finally had to leave the United Kingdom, and then he was kicked out of Greece. He couldn't even land his ship after a while. The animosity culminated in Portugal in 1975. A whole bunch of people were in the streets and someone got them all hyped up and they filled up a bunch of taxis with rocks and they went down to the Apollo and they started stoning the ship. It was a time of incredible upheaval and upset and people in the streets and this rumor went around it went like wildfire. Pretty soon you're seeing on, on walls in the harbors, Apollo equals CIA, Apollo equals CIA. Frankly, we all thought it was pretty amusing. Like, the last people in the world to be accused of, the CIA, of being the CIA is the Church of Scientology. We had been in a pitched battle with the CIA since 1950. After the incident, Hubbard returned to land, determined to uncover the source of the hostility against Scientology. What do you do when you're under assault? What do you do when you're being attacked by the biggest governments in the world? And this is not paranoia. How do you respond? How do you deal with it? Yes, there were, there were a number of directives that were written. Ultimately, when you're in a battle with the United States government, for an example, if it's simply a war of attrition, there's no doubt who's going to win a war of attrition. And the war was just beginning. When investigative reports returns, the Church of Scientology does battle with the FBI and an author who dares to attack their motives. On July 7, 1977, 134 FBI agents stormed into Scientology centers in Washington and Los Angeles. We hit the front page of every newspaper in the country at that time. At an official press conference, the church claimed that its stance against the obscure Alaskan mental health bill had made it a target of the White House. We put out a publication, and uh, Richard Nixon, who was vice president at that time, was in favor of this bill. And we attacked the bill and said that it's, uh, it's totally oppressive. And within two days, the Secret Service burst into our church and <coughs> threatened us never to use Nixon's name again, and that they were sent here on express orders of Richard Nixon. So we're not a quiet group. It was revealed that the Church of Scientology was one of the top targets of uh, the Nixon White House and was on the infamous Nixon enemies list, the White House list. But the raids revealed that Operation Snow White had gone too far. Members of the Guardian's office, in an attempt to prove a conspiracy against the church, had been robbing government files and infiltrating federal agencies. They started burglarizing government files, burglarizing media files, burglarizing psychi psychiatrist files. And uh, one of the intelligence boys walked off and told the story to the Department of Justice which had began to piece some things together. Several top Scientologists were arrested. Hubbard's wife, Mary Sue, was among those jailed for the crimes. Suddenly, this was no longer just a little thing on the side that some people were doing, like meditation and uh, chanting. This was something that was taking on the federal government, taking on the media, taking on professionals, taking on judges. And that's when Hubbard became the focus. But Hubbard had vanished. After, after the raid of 77, uh, Hubbard went into serious hiding. He was at one point hiding at a place between Los Angeles and Palm Springs out there in the, the edge of the desert. Back in Los Angeles, church officials were dealing with a public relations nightmare. With the raid of 77, they got all of our files. They got our secret packs. They got the stuff that we studied. They began to get the directives regarding how this is all done so suddenly the magic act was gone most damaging were files showing that the church waged war on its critics by dead agenting them and now dead agenting somebody means making them not be credible anymore by reason of showing the world the dirt the real dirt on them he wrote uh, at one point uh, investigate those who attack us make it as rough as possible spread lurid lies one example of this policy captured the media's attention. The FBI discovered Scientology's documents explaining what 
they were doing to Paulette Cooper uh, and how they were doing it. In 1971, Cooper had written The Scandal of Scientology. She was the first person who ever wrote a book critical of Scientology and in furtherance of their opportunistic policy of retribution called fair game uh, set her up. Operation Freakout was used to intimidate Cooper. An anonymous letter was sent to all the tenants of the apartment block she was in, I think it was something like 200 people, saying that she was a child molester. They also hired a private investigator to go to her door and put a gun to her head, uh, unloaded but pulled the trigger. The, the final trick was they somebody somehow got her fingerprints on a piece of paper and they then wrote a bomb threat on this piece of paper and sent it to an Israeli embassy. So the FBI were around there and arrested her. Paulette Cooper was driven very, very close to the brink of, of a total nervous breakdown by what happened to her. Really was a pretty stupid thing to do. But they stepped outside the law. They were thrown out of the church. Paulette Cooper refused to be interviewed for this program, citing fears of harassment by Scientology. The church claimed Hubbard knew nothing of Operation Freakout and promised it was restructuring the church. There was a reorganization that took place in order to structure the church so that nothing like that could ever happen again. What happened in 1982 was that the Church of Scientology expelled something like 600 members. And we were told, as you'll probably remember, that we weren't allowed to talk to these people. The bad press had damaged the church, which many began to describe as a cult. The 80s found the anti-cult movement flourishing. The shocking images of Jim Jones and hundreds of his followers dead from cyanide-laced Kool-Aid, still fresh in the American psyche. The sensational treatment of the incident alarmed Scientology. Jim Jones and his activity was really a fairly mainstream Christian church. They weren't some weird gang that was, uh, you know, just being invented by a, a Johnny come lately. They were, they were Christian. Now, what happened to them? I don't know. But I know what happened in the world as a result of what happened in Jonestown, which was you had the new N word, the C word, Jonestown cult. Cult, bad. Cult, Scientology. The word cult can be used, and you can imply there's a huge threat. You can imply that suddenly this organization has got its tentacles everywhere. Was the Church of Scientology a cult or a religion? In 1982, the city of Clearwater called official hearings on the matter. The church was accused of plotting to take over the city. Ex-members came forward to recount their horror stories about the church. At the hearings, former Sea Organization Captain Scott Mayer spoke about life on the ship with Hubbard. We all heard him from time to time screaming and yelling uh, on the ship at somebody who had an incredibly fierce temper. Anybody at any time could be put down in the bilges, or put up on the rails and tossed overboard. I mean, somebody would fish him out. But it was mostly the humiliation factor of being, you know, like the old walking the plank. Supposed illegal activities on board the ships were also revealed. Telex transmissions were used to set up uh, fun smuggling. And he had a couple million dollars in the strong box right on Apollo. The notion that Scientology was a dangerous cult was furthered by bizarre tales about the Rehabilitation Project Force a discipline program where sea organization members perform hard labor. You can make any religion sound really dumb. Suppose you said there's a cult in which the members of this cult, the Christian cult, they go around and they eat a biscuit which they say is the body of their God and they drink wine which they say is the blood of their God and this is a ritual. You could make this sound absurd. What's happened with Scientology is that it's become like the representative demon cult. But was Scientology a sect that endangered its own devotees or an unjustly demonized emerging religion? The policies of the church were now coming under increasing scrutiny. And the critics want some definitive answers from its founder, L. Ron Hubbard. But where was he?
The 80s saw a series of lawsuits brought against the Church of Scientology. Ex-members united, claiming they had been lied to and built out of millions of dollars. In 1985, an ex-Scientologist was awarded $39 million after she claimed the Church had falsely promised to improve her eyesight. Thousands of Scientologists converged on Portland to protest the verdict. I just don't see why something that has such a good intention is being so so persecuted. I mean, in my 10 years, I've never had to come out to this degree. Church members were fervent. I'm going to call my boss Monday morning and tell him that my religion is being attacked. Yes, Scientology works, and we want everybody in, on the planet to know that. The verdict was eventually overturned. That was a big changing point in our group, and um, Portland was uh, pivotal. The case raised questions about the prices the church charges for its courses. There are people who spent millions of dollars who didn't have millions of dollars. There, you know, there are people who left Scientology 10 years ago who are still paying back the money they borrowed to do it. There is a range of services that the church offers and provides which go from free to costing some money, depending on how one is stationed and what one wishes to do. The books are charged for more or less normal rate that books are charged for. For the courses and uh, auditing services, donations are requested. I don't have a problem with that. They need to survive. Everybody needs to survive. Plus, you put a value on something, that, that's just never been an issue for me. If people didn't want it, if it wasn't, setting, if it wasn't helping them lead better lives, they wouldn't, they wouldn't pay for it. Scientology was proving persistent in its battles. In the 80s, the church continued its fight with the IRS. We co-founded the National Coalition of IRS Whistleblowers, and this gave a forum to these former IRS agents and also people who worked in other areas of government who knew about IRS crimes or dirty tricks. And throughout all of this, not a word from L. Ron Hubbard. In fact, in 1982, Hubbard's estranged son claimed his father was dead. When's the last time you saw him? September 1959. Everybody else haven't seen him since uh, March 1980. There's got to be more to it than that. You're taking this to court. What? Well, I think we have enough evidence to show that he is probably dead. Uh, but of course, we don't have his body. The church moved fast to defuse the rumor. The Church of Scientology today produced what it called evidence to quell rumors that its founder, L. Ron Hubbard, is dead. I have here my own personal copy with the two colored <coughs> spots of ink and with Mr. Hubbard's personal fingerprint over the ink, scientifically proving <clears throat> that Mr. Hubbard had to be signing this document and putting together after February 2nd, 1983. Church officials also produced greetings from Hubbard. With inexorable promptitude, 1983 is upon us. Is that Ron Hubbard? You bet your life. The church said Hubbard was not hiding nor dodging subpoenas, but writing and directing internal technical films. There would be six messengers on duty when he was filming. One would hold his chair, one would hold a packet of cigarettes, and as soon as she saw that the cigarette he had was going out, would have to light another and give it to him. One held the ashtray, one held his pen, and so on. There were six of them round him. One of them was put on the humiliating rehabilitation project force, where she probably served for several months because she didn't get a chair there fast enough.